Hi everyone, welcome to our panel discussion today. Um, after the wind, what do we do next? Uh, looking at options for growers after they've experienced some devastating storms that have caused some major wind erosion events and crop damage in the Geraldton port zone. So welcome to our panellists today. On audio only is uh, Wayne Parker, a deep herd research scientist working on the soil science projects. Um, currently working in the soil constraints projects, which are a co-investment with GRDC. Uh, we have Dion Nickel. So, oh, sorry, Wayne is in the Geraldton office. Dion Nickel, uh, the research officer in the wheat agronomy team at the Deep Herd office in Meriden. Um, currently working in the tactical wheat agronomy projects, also with co-investment from GRDC. We have Scott Smith, a grower from South Stirlings, who currently sits on the Albany um, Port Zone RCSN. Um, Scott's come along today to talk about the um, pretty horrific 2018 experiences that they suffered down in Albany um, that had that were followed from fires followed by wind erosion events like the one we're discussing today. And also we're hoping to catch up with Craig Topham a bit later on. Craig's an agribusiness consultant with agrarian management who's a, um, in the Geraldton region and a former RCSN member. Uh, Peter Bird, the regional senior <laughs> regional senior manager for the Western Office, uh, will lead facilitation of the discussion today. And I'm Joe Wheeler, the Grower Relations Manager that looks after the Geraldton Port Zone. So I'll hand it over to Pete, and we'll get on with our discussion. Thanks very much, Joe. It certainly has been a it certainly was a, a massive wind event um, that Sunday Sunday a week ago. Um, I just like to hand over to Wayne, who's a resident in in Geraldton, and uh, and talk about you know the wind the wind event last Sunday and how that compares to wind events uh, we've had in the past. Thanks, Peter. Uh, the wind event last Sunday was um, certainly one that we hadn't experienced for a long time. It um, it was quite devastating. The winds gusts were up to 100 k's an hour, and because of a lot of contributing factors, um, the, there was a great deal of soil movement and that wind event uh, began sometime in the early morning before the sun was up and it didn't stop until we had rain and that was at about five o'clock in the afternoon. So we had over 12 hours of high wind event and um, the, the peak strengths of that wind were certainly more than we we'd seen uh, for many years. However, in the last 20 years, we have seen some nasty events, particularly 06 and 07, when a lot of the countryside was bare through drought. Um, each season, it appears, there's a, there's a bit of a pattern uh, emerging where we have a long break, a long dry spell before the break of the season, and it's getting later and later. And when that break does come, we see it um, has high wind strengths and, and low rainfall. So in the last 20 years, we've seen a number of events, but none quite like um, Sunday of a week ago. Thanks, Wayne. Certainly, it is it's not uncommon in Western Australia to get some wind erosion. Our modern farming practices have, have really helped re reduce a lot of that, but um, we've got Scott Smith from uh, the South Coast, and in 2018 there was certainly a, a, a very bad wind event, wind erosion event along the South Coast. So Scott, just tell us about briefly about where you farm and what happened in 2018. I was trying to move on from 2018, but keeps coming back. Um, so yeah, we we farm about 80 kilometres northeast of Albany, area called South Stirlings, just yeah, south of the the Stirling Ranges, of course. Um, reasonably coastal and, and you know, we, we farm fairly high rainfall, I guess, for broad acre farming, 600 mil down to probably 480 uh, our farms cover. Um, so 2018, um, we copped our first big blow on the 24th of May. Um, that was following a very dry summer, which prior to that, we had two extremely wet years in a row, which, which are generally our worst years. Um, so we had a lot of bare areas in, in paddocks that were cropped in, in 16 and 17 and also stubble wasn't anchored to the ground. Um, and this was right across the whole district. Um, also down here, there's a large 
large proportion of farmers still running a lot of livestock as well, which of course, you know, putting sheep and cattle onto onto loose stubbles um, does cause powder it up and and get those things moving. So yeah, dry dry summer in 2018 leading into seeding and uh, a lot of the district dry sowed, very similar to probably what happened in Geraldton this year. And 24th of May, um, we, we actually had a controlled burn in the National Park, the Stirling Range National Park, get away with these winds. So we're all actually out there fighting this fire the night of the first big blow, um, which, so we weren't actually thinking about what was happening to our farms, it was probably a bit of a blessing. Guys measured um, with the handheld weather meters, uh, gusts up above 120 kilometres an hour, and certainly some of the, the older guys in the district were comparing it to Cyclone Alby when it came through Albany in 1978. Um, the next morning, after the wind had died down and we all got back out there again, really you couldn't tell where the fire had been except for the burnt fence posts and the burnt trees. Every paddock was white. Um, yeah, and following that, we had another two big blows that year. And um, I mean, really, things were just starting to recover, particularly cereal crops that got cut off in the first wind um, were starting to recover when the second one hit, and that really finished them off. So then we had a lot of difficult uh, decisions to make, particularly there. Um, canola crops, uh, anything that had germinated prior to that first wind, they were gone. So most of the district were either reseeding. Uh, probably half their program. Most guys would grow canola down here or close to it. And then following the second and the third wind after that, cereal crops had to be reseeded as well. Uh, thanks, Scott. And sorry to remind you again about 2018, the start <laughs> of the season there. But um, there's a couple of similarities, I think, between what you mentioned and, and, and Geraldton this year in terms of, you know, Geraldton's coming off a pretty poor season last year. Uh, and also you, you talked about a, you know, a dry period leading up to seeding. So I'll just hand back to Wayne Parker and, and if he can uh, tell us about our farming systems now and, and, and what might have led to the, um, the, the, the wind erosion this year. Thanks, Peter. You're right to make those connections with the, um, the, the experiences of, of the Southern region in 2018 because they match up. Um, we did have a poor season last year, as I mentioned, which led to uh, low stubble cover. And then we had a dry period from pretty much September all the way through to um, end of February this year. And then we had a good rainfall event. So there were a number of growers around the region that got in excess of 30 millimetres, some up to 100 um, across the region. And in a bit like that 2018 fire that Scott mentioned, what the rain has, has done is break down whatever little stubble there already was. And immediately in, in the current farming system, because we've got that, that rainfall event, it, it, it means that we've got an opportunity, well, there was an opportunity for people to get out and deep rip. Um, so we've got a soil, that is exposed through low stubble cover, which is being broken down from that rainfall event. And then we've got the opportunity to deep rip and a lot of growers were, were deep ripping because they were able to um, get rippers into that soil. Unfortunately, what we also saw was um, a, lot, a lot of aggressive tillage in that period. Um, and Usually, um, such aggressive tillage, and I'm talking about spading in particular, but also some of those um, sort of mixing machines that, that might um, bring up a little clay from, uh, from depth and, and mulch it through. I'm talking about those as well, which leave us um, very, very bare paddocks. Um, we, you know, it, it may be that we get a, um, a, a better incorporation at that time, but I think somewhere along the line we forget that it was March and not June or July. And um, so we've, we've, those paddocks were left bare and exposed for, for a very long period of time. Um, and what we know, um, the research from, from the 80s, we know that um, 
paddocks like that one, particularly those, those sandier soils, will start to move at wind speeds of 16 kilometres an hour, which is pretty low. Um, and then it continues to move, obviously, as we get higher wind speeds. Um, so we just, yeah, that that's one of the one of the aspects that um, made Sunday's blow quite so bad was that there was um, a lot of country that had been exposed through um, deep ripping and spading. The spading um, is a lot more sensitive and will blow a lot at lot lower air speeds. Um, However, what we've got to remember is that spading is generally only going to take up about 5% and, and in a good year, maybe 10% of the whole countryside. And deep ripping, the same, it will be within, you know, uh, 20 to 30% of the, of the sandy soils in the region um, that will have been deep ripped. So we, while those paddocks were bare and exp um, more exposed to erosion, having had the, the rain break down those poor stubbles um, from last year on any country that hadn't seen um, any tillage, those paddocks too were still exposed to, er to erosion. So um, the, the areas that were shifting weren't just the areas that had been spaded and ripped. Uh, uh, previously, uh, sorry, Peter, carry on. Uh, carry on, Wayne. Um, I was just going to say previously, we the package for any soil amelioration, and we, we're going back um, 13 years or, or thereabouts, possibly maybe 15 years, when moldboard ploughing came um, into the region. The, the Recommendations for that were they were the last paddocks to be signed. The, we wouldn't be doing any mold boarding until there was at least moisture, good soil moisture, to the depth of ploughing. And then those paddocks would be ploughed and sown within 12 to 24 hours of having been ploughed. So it was effectively a uh, um, sowing straight after ploughing. Um, then we'd have, you know, we'd back right off on any pre-emergent herbicides. We'd be looking to use no pre-emergent herbicides and manage the small weed number in crop. Um, what I think has happened is that we've forgotten the, we've forgotten that we need to maintain a cover and that we need to get a crop into those paddocks really um, as soon as they are. Um, ameliorated, and the, um, the the practice of sowing within 12, 24 hours of, of that amelioration event isn't quite as common. And when you're doing it in March, for example, then you're not going to get a crop to establish, regardless, because given the heat and the, and the dry. So we really need to perhaps remember what it is that we're, we're trying to achieve with our amelioration and go back to being the last paddock that we um, ameliorate, uh, that we turn over, and it is, and that it's sown within 12 to 24 hours again. So that's where we're at. Yeah. Thanks, Wayne. And we'll, we'll come back and touch on best practices and what we can do better, perhaps in the future, in terms of soil amelioration. Um, you know, we, we we perhaps know what the perfect scenario is, but in the real world, it doesn't happen very often, and growers still need to get the job done and get gets crop crops planted. So, um, after that wind, there was rainfall, and crops are germinating now. Uh, growers are probably going around and and and, trying, and assessing, you know, what's coming up and the density and, and what's not. I'll hand over to, to Dion Nicol, who um, works in the Meriden area in particular, a leading research scientist in in, um, in Western Australia. And you also have some experience from the northeast wheat belt, Dion. And, um, could you tell us some, some issues that you see going forward with germinating crops? Let us unmute first. Sorry, Peter. Um, yeah, thanks, Peter. 
the, the, the uh, similar to, to in a way, just a different cause. But certainly paddocks that were in 2018 with extreme wind that we had uh, that year, particularly session wind, it's um, were quite disastrous for those paddocks. That were when it comes to furrow fill and had multiple problems, well, it wasn't just the, the lack of density in the in the plants, it was also how lethargic and uh, unhappy those plants were. They a fair bit, there's a fair bit of damage from the pre-emergent in the furrow. Um, you know, the, the lack of those plants was, uh, a, you know, a linear relationship with density. Effective than they'd normally be due to reduced growth rate. There's that aspect, and then having a couple of weeks later uh, cut them off, it, it just meant that we actually, uh, you know, no wind cover after several weeks. So, so that, that was in and, and you know, seeding some of those paddocks that wouldn't be getting those densities in the plant and growing as they should. A benefit in trying to get up a bit and uh, a little bit of temporary protection from that as well, and and that obviously depends on the conditions that you're working in, um, the stuff you've got to work with, and at that period of time, and various other things. But but that seeding uh, that would it would have kept a little bit more where it belonged. Uh, but another aspect that's really important that as we start getting in May and June, sort of June times, uh, the, the penalty of low density is a little bit more significant. Because of density response one, the yield potential, speaking the old rules worked on, on us uh, per yield potential as a, as a target. Um, but you also have the time sowing relationship earlier crops. Tend to be less responsive to the low, to, to increasing density just due to their ability to compensate. So there's those aspects there that, as it stands, as we stand to late May and June uh, germination times, it's more than likely the agronomic of, of reseeding areas is also going to give you that benefit in yield return as well. Um, I guess it's also working with what. You've got. So a lot of questions that people. Varieties for reasons it comes down to that pragmatism what you can with what you have, and um, generally speaking, um, the yield differences between varieties uh, again gets gets to be a bit as we start getting to later times and things like that. But it's all about about what you got. Density is the you know real for vulnerable soils situations is still one of your best tools. So you know, I asked to switch to building, but the priority is just getting as quick as you can and getting that soil stabilised. Um, the other aspect is nitrogen, which a lot of people see very small growth early. Um, it depends on the starting. If it's extremely efficient, it would help for sure. But you have 30 units of nitrogen down the chute and various other things. You, know, you, you, you may not get a huge state, you're probably better off putting even that density up and then encourage the, 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 the crop base still a bigger priority, depending, of course, on what density you've got in the paddock at that time. So it's really one of those things where growers have got to use their wisdom on what all conditions like, what you potentially change it to out of reseeding and what your density is going to do and, and various other things. So there's still a lot of, a lot of variables in that situation. How about, uh, about you, Scott, your experience in, in 2018 and uh, you must have uh, faced a lot of decisions about uh, that growers are facing now. Can you tell us a few the bit of experience from 2018 in, in terms of um, resowing crops and, and crops germinating and the, the decisions that you had to go through? Oh, look, it's... Um... It's incredibly difficult and incredibly stressful making these decisions. Um, I, and like a lot of people, relied heavily on our agronomist, um, which is another thing to remember, I suppose, is puts the agronomist under an incredible amount of stress as well and a fair bit of pressure. 
Um, the hardest thing was making a decision one way or the other, whether to look after the crop that was still there or or to reseed it. And once the decision was made and you actually get into to doing what you think you need to do, um, it, that does relieve a lot of the pressure. Um, very, very, very similar stuff to what Dion was saying. It's really looking at plant numbers per square metre, working out yield potentials. Um, the issue we had, and it may well be the same in the Geraldton zone now, was um, sourcing seed. If you'd already reseeded, oh, sorry, if you already seeded a large proportion of your program, um, issues as well. Yes. Uh, so we grow so all down here. The vulnerability. Sorry. Ability for a much greater time. So some of the paddocks we had trouble with that are. Uh, Yeah, I'm only sort of getting a bit of scratchy stuff from Dion, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, sourcing seed and what, what actually is available to plant becomes an issue. Um, so for us, we we wrote off some canola crops and depending on the date, we switched to, um, to barley. Um, and of course, depending on how long atrazine and propizomide had been down prior to that date and also how much blew away. So there's decisions to be made with chemical residues, um, what you can and can't plant. We we made the decision on a couple of paddocks where we'd actually topped up our atrazine for various reasons to replant to canola, um, which actually wasn't terribly successful. But um, yeah, barley, I think, has some useful tolerance to atrazine. And so a lot of, lot of canola, well, paddocks that were going to be canola were planted to barley, um, but some was planted to wheat because the district more or less ran out of barley seed. Um, other issues, uh, obviously your paddock's are going to be incredibly rough in places, um, denuded of topsoil and organic carbon levels and things like that have certainly dropped in the district, um, but that's probably more of a long-term thing. Certainly when, when we got hit and we started reseeding, it was, it was mostly about Getting cover on these paddocks as quickly as possible, and um, and crossing our fingers in anything that we can get some sort of return on um, that that season is is what we went for. Um, and you know we we were seeding right through towards the end of July, and then started planting some summer crops for grazing as well, depending on the paddocks um, in sort of October. So. Yeah, it does put a lot of pressure on you. It puts a lot of pressure on you the next season as well because you don't have time to get your air seeder ready this year um, if, if you're planting that late. So yeah, hope that hope that helps. Yeah, I'm getting advice from other people. Where, where the, you know, where, where, what were some of the places that you got some good advice from? Um, and, and, and yeah, okay. So like I said, we, we relied pretty heavily on our agronomist. He's, he's, he's very experienced. Um, also talking to talking to older guys in the district as well. It seen that sort of thing plenty of times before. Um, and you know, now on the south coast, we, we can plant crops quite late and still get some sort of yield. I, I realise it's different in the Geraldton zone where it gets hot um, in spring. Um, so there was a lot of young guys fairly panicking, and a lot of the older guys were saying, "Well, we've actually been through it before, and you guys will get through it as well," which was which was really quite helpful. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of stories of late late planted crops with minimal input still making some money. So, and I, I think that's you know that that's the key is to try to minimise your losses possibly, and. Um, uh, and, and have another crack next year, tidy up as much as you can, stabilise everything as quickly as you can, making the decision and, and then going with it because it, it feels like there's no right or wrong answer, <laughs> but just, just getting out there and, and doing the best that you can is, is quite helpful. You mentioned a, a couple of things about herbicides. Um, I know we can't necessarily give advice on, on herbicides here, but I'll hand over to Wayne Parker, who, who may have had some experience or can tell us some, some experience or, or what may be going on in the amelioration projects that he is working on. 
Thanks, Peter. So within the within the um, ameliorated soils project, um, Tom Edwards from Esperance has has taken on the task, somewhat Herculean task, of identifying um, management strategies for herbicides after amelioration. Um, so at this year, at this point, he has a, a, a one trial in the ground from which he's taking a large number of measurements, and he's going to be uh, taking in situ soil, uh, which he took have from the field after amelioration but before seeding, and he's going to be looking at just how um, how to determine what's biologically active. So when we've got soils of very low organic matter, we lose some of that buffering capacity. So we've got assays which will tell us just how much herbicide is still in that soil, but we don't know how much of it is biologically accessible to the plant. If we remove the organic matter, a whole lot more of it's going to be accessible to the plant. And we've seen this, um, those pre-emergent herbicides, um, Simazine, uh, soil active. It was one particular example that I can think of where we've where we've mold boarded in um, years previous. The rates of simazine have, have come back to half label rate purely because they are so active um, and they're stitching up not only the weeds but the crop as well. So yes, once we once we turn it over or we spade it through, our actives become a lot our herbicides become a lot more active. Um, so as part of the project, um, we are hoping to have a, a, a better handle on that in future. Um, from what we already know, we know that the um, yeah the, the the rates that need to be applied can come back considerably um, where we have no um, no organic carbon, and and in a number of cases, uh, our organic or organic matter has has been lost from from these paddocks, unfortunately. So we're going to have to be careful just what goes on um, this year. Um, I suspect a lot of it has already gone on, and we're going any reseeding that gets done um, may not have. Uh, any further herbicide put on it until post-emergent. Um, I know that growers are currently facing uh, Treflan damage issues, um, and um, they're not all sure where that herbicide currently is, whether it's in the in the furrow or on the fence line. Unfortunately, um, but I, I guess we'll we'll find that out with the fullness of time. Um, so there we are, Peter. That's where the project's at, and there's a lot of decisions to be made around the herbicides. And um, I suspect each paddock is going to be different, and that's where the the, the benefit of of those relationships with the agronomists, like Scott mentioned, that's where they're they're really powerful. And um, and looking at it on a, a paddock by paddock basis. Thanks, Wayne, and really important that uh, growers can can get some good advice on herbicides when they um, look at herbicides on those soils, particularly in terms of potential reseeding. There's also a couple of uh, useful uh, documents on the GRDC website that have been re that have been tweeted lately to give growers uh, some background information on herbicides and how they work. Um, but um, I'll just hand back to Dion Nickel again now to focus on, you know, going forward and. Um, and, and what growers might need to be doing to, to try and get cover on the ground as quickly as possible. We've mentioned that that's, you know, both Scott and, uh, and Wade have mentioned that's a key thing, and then yourself, Dion. So what things do growers need to be doing to try and get cover on the ground as quickly as possible? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I guess there's, there's two aspects. One is the, um, the, the, the considering the conditions you're working with in terms of um, whether that soil will form clods that are going to provide a temporary bit of protection in that reseeding, because that, uh, in some conditions with with paddocks that are already starting to move, that will be useful if they can. 
Um, but also, you know, that plant density is the uh, easiest way to get the, the stem count up, and it's um, can, can be done cheaper often than a than a than a big hit of N or other other tools. So. Look, it's also about trying to work out how much cover and how many crowns you're trying to get there for the for next autumn as well. Um, you know, as soon as we can get it up, it's not necessarily all, all about just trying to um, get the best uh, the the best return for this season, which is is starting to get a bit bit um, bit risky for some of those soils and, and 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 the timing and everything else. But it's also about ensuring and protect that resource for for as soon as we can for the rest of this year and into next year as well. So you know, bumping those those densities up, particularly as we're talking a sort of a you know late May and, and June um, germination time, you know that's where that's where low plant densities tend to tend to lose a bit more yield, as in that later scenario. If we can get them up in the start of start of May, for example, a low density can uh, compensate uh, more often than not. But but it's now that you're really going to get an agronomic boost out of that. In terms of variety choices and things like that for getting that cover, I mean, um, you know, growers are, you know, people will talk about which which varieties maybe have a bit more vigour, but you can compensate that quite quickly with your seeding rate and trying to get that cover up. So it's really, um, you know, if you can sort of start getting that 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 paddock back on track um, with say 100 150 plants a metre or thereabouts, you know, that's going to provide you a lot of protection um, compared to almost uh, anything else you can do right now. Thanks, Dion. And certainly, it's my experience that it's always those same parts of the paddocks that, 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 that always blow. And you know, we we run a budget. Where I was trying to run a budget, and but you know, this year it, it might not be about budget so much. It's simply about trying to get cover on those paddocks or those parts of the paddocks that always blow to protect them for the future. Um, Scott, you mentioned that you had multiple wind events in 2018, and I imagine those paddocks or those parts of the paddocks that blew uh, continued to blow. So how did you uh, manage uh, in 2018 to try and overcome that across a range of crops? Uh, I mean, like, like I was saying before, we switched to cereals uh, nearly everywhere we could. Um, obviously, canola takes a lot longer to cover over and be less prone to being cut off again. Um, Certainly areas in paddocks didn't perform at all. Um, and I was driving over some paddocks this morning that are actually in pasture this year and you can still see the hollows where they were taking out, out and hardly anything really growing in them. I mean, for us, we we spread a lot of clay on our sandy country. We do as much as we can each summer. And obviously the worst the worst paddocks, or well, the, the paddocks that blew the worst are the ones we've been targeting first. And I'm not sure clay spreading is an option up in the Geraldton zone, but maybe next season, if it's the right start and everything works in their favour, maybe the the ones that blew the worst are the first ones they either deep rip or spade or or, or do whatever they need to do. Um, I mean, it's going to take years to get us back to where we were, I think, exactly. But I mean, definitely, once you've run a cedar through a paddock that's been blowing, it look, looks like a paddock again, looks like soil again. Uh, certainly changes your attitude. Um, if you've got a paddock that's that's totally blown away, and, and then you've got nice furrows that are holding up, um, yeah. So um, yeah, not not sure what else you're sort of asking for there, Peter. But yeah, things along those lines certainly help. Look, we we missed you there on the sound earlier on, uh, Dion. Um, we might just go back go back to you to, to ask what you were what you were. Um, some of the key points that you raised earlier on when we were talking about cereals in particular and uh, you know in 2018 in the northeast wheat belt and uh, and what happened there yeah so we had a, a fair bit of damage obviously uh, with the furrow fill and then the trifluron damage and various other things going on and the plants that did come out were not just not just thinner they were struggling um, you know once you start growing plants a bit Bearing plants a bit deep, they start to um, lose yield and start to struggle anyway. Even if you get the, the, the number of plants per metre up, their relative growth rates are set back and everything else. So, um, you know, we had that on top of the, obviously the herbicide damage. And then, then a couple of weeks later, have another big wind event that cut most of the shoot off again. Um, yeah, you know, their growth points are down low and they can recover, but they're, they're really struggling. And it's just a matter of, you know, losing 
um, that growth continually for the first, you know, six weeks after the break is pretty, pretty, pretty miserable. And it's, um, you know, really as uh, as Scott said, you know, reseeding was was really the best tool that should have been should have been used in some of those situations for for you know restabilising that surface a bit better on those soils because those soils had the moisture and they had the clay content and other things that would at least you know form some clods they're not not going to be permanent but they're going to be good enough to get you through till you have stubble again so that's that's important to consider um, and you know it's it's really about you know, reco recovering that situation. So even at harvest, for example, on some of those paddocks, you had thin plants that started lodging and other things. We had very little cover, uh, big gaps everywhere. You know, we, we weren't even trying to harvest all the heads because we didn't want to try and go down low enough to pick them up because we were worried about the soil moving again. So, you know, it's not like those thin plants may get up and, and you're, you're home and hosed. You know, you've got a vulnerability for a period of time if you don't try and intervene. Um, and again, as I said previously, you know, if, if we get our densities up to that sort of, you know, say from 75 plants a metre up to 150 plants per metre at this sort of time of year, you know, it's going to pay to, to do that rather than do nothing. I was looking at um, to reseed or not to reseed. Uh, have you got any tips there, Dion? You mentioned plants per square metre. Do you think that's a, that's a key thing? Oh, look, I think I think the, the patches are probably more the issue. Um, you know, it's uh, and and again, you know, if the seedlings have had a lot of herbicide damage or buried too deep and various other things. They're not they're not equal to their cousins that have had a good life in terms of their growth rate early on. So, um, look, it's 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 worth you know patching out those areas and 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 growers know their paddocks. They know their vulnerable paddocks and they know the ones that are moving. And it's it's just considering, you know. Don't don't get don't get sucked into thinking. Oh well, there's enough plants there. Um, I don't need to do anything. It's also about considering you secure your resource in that soil for, you know, if it's going to cost you twenty, thirty bucks, whatever it costs you to for your reseeding program, you weigh up that cost uh, reasonably. And and you know, as I say, if you weigh up some of those densities, you should be able to get a, a recovery if your plants are a bit thin. So like I say, you know, if you're sort of sitting at fifty to eighty sort of plants per meter. Um, for a for a late May germination, um, you know, getting up above the hundreds is, is generally going to going to likely contribute another you know 10 15 percent plus a yield. So so you know if that pays, then then it's it's worth that to to try and get that extra resource. But it's also important that growers doing that are also going to be ensuring they're they're working with the conditions available. So if it starts getting that dry, that you're potentially going to make the soil more. You know, you're not necessarily going to improve the stability of that surface. You need to you need to assess that, and then obviously looking at whether you sow on the row, in between the row, all the other things that growers are getting, uh, you know, so much better at nowadays making those decisions. It's just important that growers use their 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 intuition around those things and try and get that cover up as quick as they can. Um, I think we might have have someone else on the line uh, just joined. Is that correct, Joe? Uh, yep, so Craig Topham, uh, the agrarian agron um, agribusiness consultant from the Geraldton Port Zone has managed to come in to the meeting today. So welcome very much, Craig. Craig was a former RCSN member on the Geraldton Port Zone. Yes, good morning, everyone. Yes, I've uh, managed to uh, finally get out of the paddock and uh, join the call. So yes, I'm here, Peter. I, I believe you're in the thick of it up there. Craig, uh, dealing with uh, these things today and probably on a, on, a, on a pretty constant basis at the moment. Um, we've run through a few questions with our panel, but I'd just like you to cover off on a few things. Um, firstly, just briefly, Wayne touched on it, but how this wind event compares to wind events in the last 20 years? Well, uh, I've been uh, practicing agronomy around the northern region for around 20 years, and this is by far the most significant and widespread damage we've ever seen. Um, we've had big wind events before, but not so widespread and not so sustained for such a long, you know, it was eight hours above 80 odd k's average wind speed. So the, the scale of the damage is far more than we've seen in the past, which is why we're, we're flat out reseeding a lot of country. I talked with Dion Nickel a bit about reseeding in, in cereals. Um, but we've kind of skipped over a bit the canola and the lupin reseeding decisions. Scott Smith from the from South Stirlings has talked about 
2018 and with some of the issues he faced. Um, what are the decisions growers, growers need to be thinking about in terms of reseeding canola and lupin paddocks, Craig? Well, I've, I'm just uh, parked in the corner of a uh, lupin paddock we're reseeding at the moment. And um, look, a lot of the lupins and canola, uh, some of the early selling stuff had partly emerged. And lupins that get sand significant or severely sandblasted uh, never, never prosper. Uh, they get leaf disease, brown leaf spot gets into them. They never uh, really recover properly. So if we don't get the lupins vigorous and providing good ground cover, the biggest issue is not now. It's actually next summer and prior to next sowing season. So we've got to get the cover up on those paddocks. And the high traffic areas, such as headlands, uh, we're seeing a, a huge reduction in plant numbers where we had emerged crops. So we've got to go and thicken those areas up. But a, a large portion of the lupins actually hadn't emerged before the wind. So now we're seeing those lupins were actually um, yeah, quite happily sitting in dry soil. Uh, they might be quite shallow now, and so I've been blown out of the soil and moved around. But now they're all germinating quite well. And a lot of the paddocks, apart from the high traffic areas, uh, where we've had a little bit of stubble, especially standing stubble, and so on east-west, uh, the lupins are emerging quite well. So we're not having to reseed as much of the lupin that hadn't emerged as we thought. And, uh, canola, on the other hand, um, again, if we don't get adequate plant numbers, it's not now. It's the next summer and establishing into a bare paddock next year we have to worry about. So we are having to thicken up quite a few canola paddocks um, by just rolling in, uh, uh, lightly touching the soil, dropping uh, more seed in so we're not disturbing the plants that are there too much and thickening those paddocks up. We've done that a number of times over the years and you have to do it to get the cover on the soil. And if we get a half reasonable season, we've seen these paddocks come through and yield, yield quite well. So, I mean, um, you're suggesting growers are reseeding lupins on lupin paddocks, canola on canola paddocks, and cereals on cereal paddocks, Craig? It depends on the chemical package that uh, has been put down. Uh, there's a few paddocks of canola where we haven't used propismide. We're selling back to barley or wheat. But uh, the majority where we've got, um, the majority of paddocks have had, uh, had propismide in front. So the option to go to a cereal is no longer there. Um, there's a few we were, we're holding back on, so we do have an option still. And most lupins get um, a good dose of simazine, metribuzin. We do sow barley into that, although um, where we've used propismide as well, we don't have an option. We have to go back to our broadleaf. We covered, uh, you know, the past and, and, and what growers' decisions are at the moment and, and what they might be able to do. But we'll move on to the future now. And I'll hand back over to Wayne Parker, uh, who was talking about amelioration and deep ripping in our farming systems. And just, you know, what, what do we do in the future to uh, try and overcome this issue, Wayne? I think the uh, important point is that we remember why we're we doing it. Why is it that we're ameliorating it? Um, particularly when it comes to spading or mouldboard ploughing or one-way ploughing with the with the plaza, for example. Um, why are we doing it? It's, well, it's to get rid of the weeds. It's to help with our soil water repellents. It's to help mix in some uh, some lime that we've got sitting on the surface that we want through the profile. All of those things work a great deal better when the soil's wet. So let's look to the future of doing those amelioration practices when the soil is wet and when we've got a reasonable chance of establishing a crop on that um, later in the season. So rather than uh, we, we'll be looking at moving the aggressive amelioration away from the early part of the season and back into the June, um, late June, as it as it was when we began it. Um, those are one of the um, the main things. Now, if the technology works here, I'd like to just try and and share my um, screen because I think. We, this particular uh, example makes, um, now, are you able to see that screen as it comes up? Yeah, 
Excellent. What I've got there, and I'm just going to highlight it with my cursor. Can you see the cursor? Yeah, what we no. have. Let's just describe it, Mike. Okay, I'm going to describe it. And what we're looking at there is a soil, a sandy yellow soil that has been spaded dry. Uh, it was spaded ahead of the season. And what you may be able to see is that the spading has worked to a depth of approximately 320 mil. Um, and you can see little tails there that run out the bottom. And those dark tails are, um, oh, those, okay, so I've got the wrong screen, apologies. Um, so what those dark tails are, are the, Um, topsoil organic matter that's fallen down behind a ripping time with a, a topsoil sliding plate on. So um, let me just stop sharing for a sec. Apologies for that. I was Are you seeing that a little clearer? Yeah, I can see a picture and the title is Spaded Dry. Okay, excellent. Now that I was mentioning is down to 320 approximately. It's spaded that very neatly, but what you see in there is quite a large purple bulge where that lime has is still sitting and that lime is still is sitting at around 250 mils. The lime here that you can see, these little tails that I may, made mention of, are the tops or slotting plates in action, which this paddock was deep ripped prior to spading. But because it was spaded dry, we've only got you know, a total depth of, of working there of about 320. We shift that, now I don't have the scale on the side, to spaded wet, um, we've got a far greater depth of profile. The spading has worked all the way down here to almost 500 mil. Um, I have a scale on the next slide, but what you'll also see is that purple band through here, which is that line that's been mixed through that whole profile because it was spaded wet. The spading has worked a whole lot more efficiently. The spade's been able to grab hold of moist soil on the surface and push it down through the profile. Uh, as well as bring up uh, from depth. And we've got that soil from the topsoil down into the subsoil at another um, 200 mil effective, effectively. And that's, um, okay, so there's the scale here. We've got it down to 450. Those spades that have come down have managed to grab a whole lot of topsoil and shift it a lot deeper because it was wet. Now the, the grower whose place this is on has decided that from here on he will be he will be um, seeding wet. Uh, sorry, spading wet. And uh, and really that's perhaps the the main thing I'd like growers to consider from here on and into the future for their amelioration is uh, do it wet. It does a better job, and if um, and do it it's such a time that you can seed within 12, 24 hours to establish a crop on that. So those are the main messages that I'd go with there later. Thanks, Wayne. And everyone's aware of the big investments that GRDC has with DPIRD in, in soil amelioration and, um, and the future. Can you just uh, tell us briefly what, what some of those things are in terms of perhaps farming practices and wind erosion? You, you, you've mentioned the, you know, the uh, amelioration or spading when the soil's wet. Uh, is that a big part of the project going forward? It is part of. It does make part of the project. Um, the other uh, aspects that we're focusing on are around trying to improve the water holding capacity of the soil, or rather, being able to access the um, all of that water in your soil. Uh, so it's not just the sands that we're focusing on in this project, but also those 
duplex soils of the south and and um, and eastern regions where we have sand over clay or sand over gravel or a, a loam that's um, that has a duplex nature how we might improve root access in those soils to extract more water so uh, it's not just about spading and it's not just about sands we're certainly covering all of those uh, those other areas and as I mentioned there's there is quite a focus on what we do post amelioration so we'll be investigating uh, rolling uh, of the surface and our, and our surface prep uh, timing of of that amelioration so that we can show the 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 costs and benefits of, of the timing, so before or during or um, it, during spring or before the um, before the break of the season, um, they all they're all part of this this work as as we um, look to the next couple of years. Thanks very much, Wayne. Um, Scott, just to finish off, I'll hand over to you, and if you, we'd love to hear what. You might have changed in your farming system or farming practices post 2018, and any other little tips you might have for growers uh, in the next next couple of months. Oh, look, we probably the biggest thing since 2018 for us in particular it hasn't happened across the entire district, but we probably yeah made a, a real conscious decision not to dry seed into into paddocks that didn't have enough cover, whereas Prior to 2018, I think just chasing the real top end yield, everyone was just really going for it. Um, whatever date, everyone started. Um, so I'm just getting a bit of feedback there. Um, so that's probably it for us. We are looking at changing or starting to change a bit of our rotation. Um, currently, we're planting canola into into pasture paddocks, which obviously is the most prone. To uh, to blowing, um, there's talk around the place of you know do yeah you know, how, how does it work out financially if we plant cereals into pasture and then follow it with canola? Um, obviously, there's a lot of ramifications there for the whole production system. Um, so that's probably it. Obviously, um, guys with the capacity are, are spreading clay on the real sandy paddocks and maybe even accelerated their rate of doing that. Certainly where we're, we're clay topping, uh, wind erosion is a lot less of an issue. Still still can happen, but a lot lot less of an issue. Um, as far as other things to do, um, it's obviously quite overwhelming when it first happened. There's a lot of mess um, and there'll, there'll be things that don't, you don't quite consider to be an issue that will become an issue. Certainly for us, uh, all of our sheds, the guttering was chock-a-block full of sand and we first noticed that when grass started growing out the top. Um, you know, so there, there are some of the things that need, need to be thought about at some stage. Obviously, it's not going to be high on the list of priorities yet. But definitely, like I was saying before, when you make the decision to reseed and you see fresh, freshly formed furrows on paddocks that have been blowing, that is a bit of a boost. And also the clean up, um, while it, it it really is one of the crappiest jobs, cleaning up dirt off the side of sheds and off fence lines and picking up fallen over trees and silos or whatever else. Um, when things are cleaned up, it does create a bit of normality back on the farm again. And you know that, that those sort of psychological boosts, I suppose, after a pretty pretty um, stressful period, um, they are really helpful. Um, but I guess. <clears throat> I mean, for us, we've got a pretty tight knit community. I'm sure it's the same up there. Going down our local sporting club and talking to everyone else, um, we all knew it wasn't just us. But talking about all, you know, when you know everyone's got the same problems, that really is really is quite helpful. And um, yeah, all, all I guess I'll, to the guys up north, I'll say good luck to to you guys, and um, you will get through it. I'm absolutely sure. Um, just need a bit of rain and, and things will look green in no time at all and, and away you go. So yeah, good luck. Thanks very much, Scott. That's fantastic advice. I'll hand back to Joe Wheeler now. I would like to thank you all for your time today. So on audio, um, as I mentioned, we had Wayne Parker and to joining us lately, Craig Topham. 
Um, and thank you very much for your time, Scott Smith and Dion Nicol as well. And thank you very much, Pete, for organising, uh, for facilitating the discussion today. And as Scott said, yep, good luck to all those guys um, and people up in Geraldton Port Zone um, with the clean up and the season going forward. Thanks, Joe.